All right, we are in Acts chapter 4, so if you'll turn over there to Acts chapter 4. Once again, we are going through the book of Acts, and uh, it's going to take us a while. I guess those of you that have been with us, you've already figured that out since we're just now in Acts chapter 4. But there are 28 chapters, and there's a whole lot here, and so we're thrilled to be able uh, to work through the book. Uh, I've entitled the, the, um, um, the, the message tonight, Yes or No, because that really is the question that we have to answer. Are we going to follow Jesus or are we not going to follow Jesus? And so we're in Acts chapter 4. We'll be looking at verses 13 through 31. Uh, while you're turning there, just by way of quick review, I want to give you the four things that the church was built on. When we were in Acts chapter 2, we looked at Acts chapter 2, verses 42 through 47. And these are the four things. So somebody says, what was the church built on in the first century? Well, this is what they are. Number one, on teaching. Number two, on fellowship. Number three, on the breaking of bread. And number four, on prayer. So once again, number one, on teaching. Number one, the teaching. You remember what the Bible says? The Bible says that they continued in the apostles' doctrine. Number two, on fellowship, they got together. How many of you believe it's important for the church people to get together? I mean, you know, when you get out in this world sometimes and you hear everything that's going on and see everything that's going on and even, even the mess that's, that's going on with the shootings this weekend, you'll notice most of the time I don't talk about current events. I'll bring them up from time to time, but I know everybody watches the news. And, man, when you come to church, uh, the last thing I want to do is drag you through the last week's tragedies. But, you know, we do need to recognize that this is a messed up world. And that's why we come together, is that we'd be reminded that not everybody is following after this dark culture. Not everybody, you know, is going after the way of, we're going to see this week, the way of Cain and Balaam and, and Korah. Uh, I believe this. I believe that when God's people get together, it just kind of gives us a, can I say this, a spiritual shot in the arm, so to speak. It's what we need. And then the breaking of bread. Y'all know, as Baptists, we like to break bread and meat and desserts and everything else. So, you know, we, we love that. And then prayer, like we just spent a, a little season of. You know, we just need to, that's what the church is built on. Good teaching, sound teaching, fellowship, getting together, eating together, and praying together. And all of those things are, are encompass what? Just a strong unity. Uh, Ray Stedman said this. He said, if the church was doing what it's supposed to be doing, people could not stay out. If the church was really doing what we're supposed to be doing, people could not stay out. If we were living exactly as we were supposed to live and preaching and teaching and ministering as we are supposed to, uh, I don't, people, people wouldn't stay out. I like what A.W. Tozer said too. He said, the world is waiting to hear. The world is waiting to hear an authentic voice, a voice from God. Now, you know, when it talks about an authentic voice, it's talking about a man or a woman, somebody who has given themselves totally over to God to where they are hearing from God. You know, preach, you're going to have two different types of pastors in the world, two different types of preachers in the world. Number one is the preacher who reads after other preachers who have heard from God. And then you have the preachers who are actually hearing from God. And, and I know sometimes it's going to be both. I mean, I, I, obviously, I'm that preacher that reads after other preachers who have heard from God. Otherwise, I wouldn't be quoting A.W. Tozer right now because he's a guy who heard from God. But I don't want to be the preacher, and I don't want to be the person that just reads after people that hears from God. I want to be the person that hears from God. Yeah. That's when your voice becomes truly authentic. It's when you've heard from God. Not just you've read after somebody that hears from God, but you yourself are hearing from God. And you notice what he says. He says, not an echo of what others are doing and saying. In other words, you're not just regurgitating what somebody else who heard from God is saying, but you heard from God yourself. Now, let's, let's stop for a second. I'm not talking about you hearing an audible voice. You know, I'm talking about you reading his word and God's spirit speaking into your heart and into your soul what he wants you to know. He says, not, not what others are doing and saying, but an authentic voice, a voice that is, is expressed and manifested out of a heart and a mind that is totally given over to God. And so when we get to Acts chapter 4, we are hearing from two preachers who have been with Jesus. Matter of fact, the Bible says they took note that they had been with Jesus. And we're talking about Peter and John. You don't get any more authentic than Peter and John in terms of men who God has spoken to and they are speaking to us. Now, just by way of quick review, just so you'll remember, the crippled man in Acts has been healed by the gate beautiful. After that, Peter preaches a three-hour sermon. From 3 o'clock till 6 o'clock, he preaches. He and John, uh, as a result of that sermon, they're imprisoned overnight and they're arraigned by the Jewish council or by the Sanhedrin. The Sanhedrin, just by way of, of a reminder... 
uh, is, is, a, is a, like the, the Jewish Supreme Court. It's made up of 70 members of elders and, 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 and rulers and Pharisees and so on and so forth, Sadducees at this point in time. And then the last member, uh, the 71st member, is the high priest. And so there's 71 members of this Supreme Court. And this is who Peter and John stand before in Acts chapter 3 and Acts chapter 4. When the council asked by what power the man was healed, do you remember last week they said, by what power was this man healed? Peter responded, And Peter says it was through the power of Jesus of Nazareth. And then he goes on to say, not just Jesus of Nazareth, but Jesus of Nazareth, who you, and he points to the Sanhedrin. By the way, you remember this, all of the Sanhedrin wasn't present when they convicted Jesus. There's a lot of guys that weren't present. Remember, they had the, the hearing at night. There's a lot of illegal, illegal, illegal things that had gone on. But that's another message. Peter goes on to say, though, to answer them, he says this. He says, it's the power of Jesus, of Nazareth, whom you crucified. And then he says in verse 12, and this is where we left it last week, he said, by the way, there is no other name given by whereby a man must be saved. It's the powerful, wonderful name of Jesus. And all God's people say well, this brings us up to speed to here. We're going to look at the rebuke. Look at verses, look at verse 13, verses 13 through 18, uh, the rebuke. Our Bible says, Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, you remember what he's just said. Let's go back and read verse 12 so we can kind of read it, you know, uh, as it's written. Peter says, Nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men uh, by which we must be saved. Now watch what happens. Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, and perceived that they were uneducated and untrained men, they marveled, and they realized that they had been with Jesus. They took note that they had been with Jesus. That's the most, one of the most important things that can be said about any of us. And seeing the man who had been healed standing with them, they could say nothing against it. You know, it's hard to, it's hard to speak against the miracle when the evidence for the miracle is standing right there. But when they had commanded them to go aside out of the council, they conferred among themselves, saying, What shall we do to these men? For indeed, that a notable miracle has been done through them is evident to all who dwell in Jerusalem, and we cannot deny it. See, they're, they're, they're in a pickle here. <laughs> because, you know, they, they don't want to acknowledge that they've healed in the name of Jesus, but yet only God can perform a miracle of this magnitude or a miracle of any magnitude. And so they're in a pickle because they, they realize, okay, they said we crucified Jesus. And they're saying Jesus is the power behind this. So if Jesus is the power behind this, then Jesus is God because only God can do these kind of miracles and a notable miracle. So they don't even know what to do. See, it's at this point, and it's, very, it's so hard to understand. Why don't people just say, let's just acknowledge who Jesus is? I mean, the evidence is all around them. Peter's preaching the evidence is there, and yet they say, what are we going to do? We can't deny it. Well, if you can't deny it, don't. <laughs> right? If you can't deny it, then don't. But there are so many people. We're going to talk about this on Sunday. Again, you remember last week we talked about those filthy dreamers? Hey, there's something about, you know, we're going to talk about Cain, and we're going to talk about Balaam, and we're going to talk about Korah on Sunday morning, specifically Cain. There's something, you know, this afternoon I was thinking about. Not one of those guys are atheists. Cain believed in God, Balaam believed in God, Korah believed in God. It didn't have anything to do with not believing in God. It had to do with the rebellious heart toward God. You know, we'll talk about that a little bit, but that's what these guys have. You know, they, but these guys believe in God. They just don't believe that Jesus was the Son of God, and they sure don't want to acknowledge that Jesus is the power behind this miracle. So in verse 17, But so that it spreads no further among the people, because we can't have that, let us severely threaten them that from now on they speak to no man in, in this name. They don't know who they're dealing with, do they? <laughs> so they called them and commanded them not to speak at all nor teach in the name of Jesus. Now, the Sanhedrin here is very quick to point out that Peter and John are uneducated men and they have no Jewish pedigree. And of course, that was vitally important to these men because all of these men had been educated. They had gone, you know, to, to the places of higher learning and they, they had studied Hebrew and they'd studied Israel's history and they considered themselves to be very educated. And so they look at Peter and John and they're just, these guys are just fishermen. And so they're like, you know, by what power do you do this and how do you speak this? You know, but as uneducated as Peter and John seemed, they had graduated with honors from the University of Jesus Christ. 
And ladies and gentlemen, it don't get any better than that, especially when you're talking about theology. They were not formally educated, but they were not uneducated. Now, again, they're simple fi fishermen, but they are preaching theology and they are preaching doctrine. Uh, I'm reminded of, of 1 Corinthians chapter 1, where our Bible says this, you know, it says, for, for you see your calling, brethren, that not many, and this is so important to know, not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. Paul points that out. Now, now let's, let's talk about Paul, though. Was Paul noble and was Paul mighty in speech and was Paul well, well, mighty in, in, in intelligence? He said that he wasn't in speech, but I, I have a sneaking suspicion that he was. When you talk about Paul, Paul was called and Paul was, Paul was of this, the opposite of what he's describing here because he's all of these things, but he says this. He doesn't say not any. He says not, not many, you know. It's not that not any, but not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. So think about that with Peter and John. Peter and John would not have been considered to be wise necessarily. They wouldn't be considered to be mighty, and for sure they weren't considered to be noble. But watch what verse 27 says, and I thank God for this because this is my category. God has chosen the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise. Anybody with me? Anybody here foolish? I, I, I think I am, I, I, and I know Tim is, so we just keep going. No, I'm kidding. And God, <laughs> God has chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame the things which are mighty and the base things of the world and the things which are despised by the world, God has chosen. And the things which are not to bring to nothing the things that are that, and here's, here's the reason why. God wants no flesh glorying in his presence. For of him you are in Christ Jesus who became for us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. But you say, why doesn't God just, just call, why is it just mighty men? Well, God doesn't want. He wants people to stand back just like these men and say, these guys are uneducated. How are they doing this? So that these men can proclaim we're doing it through the power of God. Now, here's the thing. If you're mighty and noble and wise, according to this world standards, if you accomplish anything in Christianity or in the spiritual realm, you're still having to do it through God. It still has nothing to do with what you have because every good gift and every perfect gift is from above. But, you know, when God takes just a foolish guy, God takes just an, uh, a guy who, who's maybe, uh, you know, in, in ignobility or whatever, how you, how you want to describe it. When God takes those people, just simple people like you and like me, and he uses us like he uses Peter and John, the world has to step back and take note and say, from where does this power come? And we can answer boldly and we can proclaim it does not come from within us. It comes from him. And that's exactly what Peter and John do here. Peter and John here, they're not taking any credit. Not many noble, not many wise, not many mighty are called. He says he uses the foolish things to confound the wise, and here's why. That no flesh, no person, no man, no woman will ever glory in his presence. The only person that, re that, deserve, that deserves to receive the glory is God. That's it. That's as far as it goes. So the most incriminating evidence of all, though, here is that a true miracle has for sure taken place uh, at the words of Peter, according to this passage, because the crippled man is standing right there in front of them. So it's not like they can say, well, this didn't really happen, and we're kind of questioning this. No, they're looking there, and they're saying, well, this guy, remember, he was over 40 years old. He had been crippled from birth. And so everybody in Jerusalem, they said all of Jerusalem, well, apparently all of Jerusalem knew the guy because all of Jerusalem would come to the temple to pray. So they had seen the guy, so there's no way that, I mean, there, how many eyewitnesses are there in Jerusalem that had seen the guy there at 3 o'clock at some point in time? They knew the guy was crippled. You say, well, he might have been faking. For 40 years? For 40 years? I mean, really, uh, they knew that a miracle, a demonstration of divine power, I believe this is worth a thousand arguments. A demonstration of God's divine power is worth a thousand arguments. A notable miracle, a remarkable sign had been done, and the council could not deny it. They even say, we can't even say anything against it. I mean, there's no way for us to even speak against this. So in truth, the objective of this arraignment was to put Peter and John on the defensive. I mean, they said, we're going to bring them in. We'll put them on the defensive. Well, they get them in there, and guess what? Peter turns it around and puts them on the defensive. They're the ones that have to defend. As it turns out, it's the Sanhedrin who, who gets put on the defensive. But this is especially embarrassing to them because Peter is claiming that they crucified Jesus and that Jesus rose from the dead and that Jesus is the power behind this miracle. And so they're totally embarrassed. 
The council knew there was no evidence to the contrary. Don't you think that they at this point had searched high and low for the body of Jesus? Don't you think that they had exhausted every effort that they possibly could put forth to find the body of Jesus, to find the culprit, to examine the people, to, to, to bring in the witnesses? And, and everybody's saying, hey, you know what? We don't, we don't know what happened. Except the disciples, what are they saying? We've seen him alive. There's 500 people that are going to say they saw him alive. And so as you look at this, you know, they can't, e they can't even defend against their belief that somebody stole the body of Jesus because they have no evidence whatsoever. All the evidence points to Jesus got up. You'll notice that when Peter speaks of the resurrection, the Sanhedrin, they, they refuse to address it. I just gave Brandon a book. Um, that it's one of my favorites. It's called More Than a Carpenter by Josh McDowell. And, and, and in that book, if you've never read it, I've got some extra copies in my office. Brandon, you're going to enjoy it a lot. Uh, it just simply defends the resurrection of Jesus and gives the evidence behind it. Because people say there's no evidence for the resurrection. All the evidence points toward the resurrection. Every bit of it. Every bit of it. And so as these guys are hearing these words from Peter and John, they are understanding, listen, you know, for some time now, we've been trying to disprove the resurrection of Jesus and we're missing the one thing that we need, the evidence, the body. We can't find the body and we can't give any logical these guys are allergic to common sense. That's basically what I'm saying. You know, I mean, you know, when you look at it, you realize there is no other explanation. It's no exp there's no other explanation at all. It never occurred to these guys, hey, maybe Jesus is alive. Well, he is alive. By the way, the Apostle Paul is going to discover that in Acts chapter 9. It didn't occur to him either until he looked up and saw him, right? When you look up and see him, there's no denying it. So how did they handle Peter and John? Well, the Bible says here they huddled together and they come up with this brilliant foolproof plan. Well, not quite. In verse 18, here's what they say. In verse 18, so they called them and commanded them not to speak nor to teach in the name of Jesus. Yeah, that's going to work. Yeah, that, what Peter's going to say, oh, well, if you put it that way, okay, I won't do it anymore. That's not how it's going to work. That's not how it's going to work. I mean, they say, well, just tell them to be quiet. Tell them to stop preaching in the name of Jesus. That'll stop them in their tracks. Well, in light of this admonishment, Peter and John have a decision to make, and it goes back to our title. I don't, I'm not going to take you back to our title because it's so simple, but it goes back to our title. They have to respond to this admonishment, and it's going to be a yes or it's going to be a no. Yes, we will obey God, or no, we will not obey God. Yes, we will continue to obey God and preach in the name of Jesus, or we will buckle under this pressure. And again, that's the same decision that we have to make. And I'm asking you to make this decision for this reason this evening. I'm asking you to make this decision because if you wait until we are put in this position to make it, you'll make the wrong decision. You will make the wrong decision. You know, there's something that's, that's universally true, and it's this. The more that you feel, the less you will think. The more that you feel, the less you will think. Now, John Hoots is in this room and, and probably some other football players and basketball players. Wh what do you do when you get on the court and, and you really, you really want to get an advantage over the other team? You know what you do? You get in their head. But you're not really getting in their head. You know what you're getting in? You're getting in their heart. You're going to say things that make them mad. You're going to say things that, that disturb them. You're going to say things that frustrate them. And you're going to do things. Because you know what happens? As soon as you get them to start to feel anger, you know what, you know what happens? The anger comes in and the thinking goes out. The anger comes in and the thinking goes out. Many of you, right now, you can go back to a decision that you made, and you made it when you were mad, right? How many, how many times has a guy just hauled off and slapped somebody, hauled off and hit somebody? Because what happened? He started feeling, and he stopped thinking. That's why that Jesus, and that's why that God expects for us to worship God with all our heart and our soul and our mind. We do, our heart is very, very important because it's where our emotions emerge from. However, we have to remember that sometimes your heart will take you places that your mind does not want you to go. That's why you have to bring every thought into captivity. 
Because if you do not, what will happen is your heart will give you frustration. Your heart will give you anger. Your heart will give you bitterness. Your heart will give you hurt. And those are natural emotions that we, we, we should feel. There's righteous indignation. There are things that we should feel. However, we have to realize that sometimes this has to rescue this. Because this will take you places that you don't want to go. So, you know, I say that for this reason. We're going to be put in situations as we move forward, that's going to make us angry and it's going to hurt us and it's going to play on our emotions. And if we are not careful, uh, careful, our emotions will take over and our mind will stop thinking. So we have to worship God with our mind as well as our heart. Yes, our emotions should be geared toward God and toward others, but here's what can happen. I've seen it happen, especially in the political realm. In the political realm, I have seen people get so mad that they stop thinking along the lines of Christianity. And they just think along the political lines and the, the lines that have been drawn. And ladies and gentlemen, we are Christians before we're politicians. And the day is going to come when we're going to be called on to think like Jesus. Now that doesn't mean you divorce your feelings completely from you because your feelings are so important. Your, your feelings are important in your salvation because the Holy Spirit, you know, uh, brings, uh, brings a, a, a conviction that comes into your heart. But you still have your mind to understand and to know what truth is. And so we have to keep those things in balance as we move forward because the time is going to come when this world is going to start pushing all of our buttons. And if we're not careful, we'll be reactors instead of responders. A reactor is a person that has a knee-jerk reaction based on their feelings. A responder is a person that, re that, that processes the information and then brings all of those thoughts into captivity and then responds through the feeling of the Holy Spirit. And so I believe Peter and John here, I believe that they are, are, are serving Jesus out of their heart, but they're also thinking too. They're not letting these guys get in their head. They're just responding in the way that Jesus told them to respond. And so that is so important. And so as we look at this response here, that's what we're going to see. That's my next um, point here. It says, as we look at verse 19, their response. Notice how they respond. But Peter and John answered and said to them, you bunch of no good scoundrel. No, see, they didn't say that. Watch what they said. Now their hearts, no doubt, I'm sure they're feeling it in their hearts, but they're thinking and they're thinking back of, what Je uh, of the things that Jesus had taught them. And they say this, whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you more uh, than, than God to judge, than, than to God, you judge. Let me read it again because I messed it up. Whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you more than, than to God, you judge. For we cannot speak the things which we have, we cannot speak the things which, uh, we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. So when they further threatened them, they let them go, finding no way of punishing them because of the people since they all glorified God for what had been done. For the man was over 40 years old on whom this miracle of healing had been performed. Now here Peter and John, they appealed to the higher court, which is what we're going to have to do. When, when, when we are brought before the Sanhedrin, so to speak, of our time, we were brought before the courts, whether it be a literal court or just be the court, you know, of public appeal or, or public consensus, whatever the court is, we're going to be brought before that. And we have to keep in mind that these guys are standing here before the very people who are supposedly supposed, to, they're supposed to be representing God to Israel. The Sanhedrin are supposed to be representing God and they are understanding that everybody in the room understands one thing. You know, here's the common denominator of everybody in the room. Everybody in the room understands only God can perform a miracle. Everybody in, the, in this room understands that. And you remember Nicodemus made that very clear when he came to Jesus. You remember what he said? He said, no man can do these miracles except God be with him. So Nicodemus had already set the precedent here that Jesus must be from God. Now, here's what we know. Nicodemus thought he was a, a prophet sent from God. He didn't know he was God who was sent to prophesy. There is a huge difference between the two, all right? But Nicodemus didn't know that yet. He found that out, I, I believe, later. But Nicodemus was speaking to Jesus in John chapter 3. But Peter and John, they claimed they did it in the power of this same Jesus. So they are actually proposing that Jesus and God are synonymous in identity, and by the way, I'm proposing the same thing tonight. Can I get an amen? 
They are the same. Peter puts the final nail in the coffin of the debate, debate by simply saying, we are going to obey God rather than you. Now, that's where our thinking comes in. We are going to obey God rather than you. you can, and he, sa- he says this, he says, you can decide what you want to do. That's up to you. But we're going to obey God rather than you, and we can only tell you the truth as we've seen it and as we've heard it. That's all we can do. Acts 5, 29. I don't know if I have that. Do I have that? Go over to Acts chapter 5 and look at verse 29 because it's a little bit of a similar situation here. And, and I'll say a lot more about the context here when we get there. But our Bible says in verse 29, because they're in a, a similar situation, P- Peter and the other apostles answered and said, here it is, we ought to obey God rather than man. Make note of that, because when we get there, we'll talk about it a little bit more. But this, this seems to be the theme of Peter throughout you know, his ministry, is I'm going to obey God rather than men. In other words, as we've said before, make God, make Jesus your only audience. If, if, listen, if we can just do that, if we can make Jesus our only audience, it'll solve so many problems. Peter was saying, we don't care what you say. We obey the higher power, and he is our God. And we have seen Jesus ourselves, and so we cannot deny that he's alive. We can't deny it because we've seen it ourselves, and we're convinced. Now, the question arises. Here's the big question. Do we obey God or the government? Because I think as you have seen, our government is not going in the way of God. All right, so, so now we are in a, in a position. You remember I, I've mentioned to you before, in the 20th century, people gave opinions. Now, in the 21st century, they're given facts. And you better obey these facts, and you better acknowledge these facts. Otherwise, we're going to cancel you out. And that is happening. You know, we talked about the coach, Joe Kennedy, on the 50-yard line. He prayed on the 50-yard line, and what happened? They fired him. Now, thank God the Supreme Court had, you know, cooler heads and wiser heads prevailed, a few of them anyway. They're not all wise up there. Y'all know that, right? But according to 1 Peter 2 and Romans 13, I'm not going to go there. We'll go there at another time. Peter and Paul, they make it clear that we are to submit to the government right until we are called on to disobey God by the government. There are, there are compulsive laws. There are restrictive laws. Some, some of those laws are like you have to do this. Some of those laws says you cannot do this. You know, you're restricted laws. You cannot do this. There's compulsive laws. You have to do this. And let's just be honest, you know, uh, not all of them are godly. A lot of, they're getting more and more ungodly. Uh, what happens when they tell us we can't preach the full counsel of the Word of God here at Peace Saving Baptist Church? What happens? I guess I'm going to jail because we've been called on to preach the full counsel of the Word of God. Now you say, well, well you're disobeying the government. Right. But the government has just told me to disobey God. That's right. And so you say, at what point do we go against our government? Well, we go against our government at the point that they tell us to go against God. And so we have, otherwise, First Peter 2, Romans 13, we're supposed to submit to the government right up until that point. But when the government contradicts God... We are to contradict the government. That's, that's the principle that Peter and John are demonstrating here in Acts chapter 4. Now, civil disobedience, it's a tough subject. I know that because you must make sure that you have black and white, clear-cut biblical substantiation. There are some people that say, I'm going against the government, and they don't even have Bible for it. Well, if you're going to go against the government, have some Bible for it. You know, I, I feel bad. These, these pastors, you know, I was reading years ago and even here recently, pastors in Canada called on to, to marry uh, same-sex couples and, and they have to do it or else, you know, the government, uh, you know, is, is after them. And, you know, it just, it just, it's just really disturbing. And that day may, co- may come to the United States when they say John Bowman and Peace Haven Baptist Church have to comply well i got news we don't have to and we won't because at that point we cease to be a church because the church preaches the full counsel of god and we don't be mean about it you know i'm not going to go out here and make a big deal about it it's just that when they come knocking on our door you know we we've already beefed up and strengthened our constitution to the point that they understand where we stand we're standing where the bible stands the bible stands where god stands and we can do no other And that's what Peter and John say. They say, you know, you can tell us not to do this, but we're going to do it anyway because a higher power, that's who we answer to. And this church answers to a higher power. And so we've got to be aware of that. 
How about Exodus chapter 1? You remember this? Exodus chapter 1. This is when Pharaoh was telling the midwives to do something that's horrendous. Remember these midwives? There's a couple of them, Shipra and Pua, but look what it says. Then the king of Egypt, Pharaoh, spoke to the Hebrew midwives, of whom the name of one was Shipra and the name of the other was Pua. Now watch what happens. And he said, when you do the duties of a midwife for the Hebrew women and see them on the birth stools, if it is a son, then you shall kill him. But if it is a daughter, then she shall live. And watch what they did. But the midwives feared God. Somebody say amen. amen. And did not do as the king of Egypt commanded them, but saved the male children alive. Now, that's an example of what God is calling on us to do. And by the way, God blessed them for it. I mean, you know, and so, so we need to realize this. We need to realize that we may be put in a position just like these midwives where our president, if you can figure out where he's at, where our president is telling us what, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I didn't mean that, sorry, strike that from the record, all right, but, so I, but maybe I know, I hate to speak the truth, but, but the, the, the truth is, you know, that there may come a time when our president or our country calls on us and says, okay, this is what you're going to do. But if it contradicts what God has said to do, then we need to realize we got to go with God. We must go with God. I don't have this for you, but I, I'm, my, my two favorite books in all of the Bible is one in the New Testament, one in the Old Testament. My favorite New Testament book is the book of John. My favorite book in the Old Testament, it's probably no secret, is the book of Daniel. My favorite book, bar none. Now, I don't know why I have a favorite book, but I just do. But it starts off with a young man in a foreign country against his own will, kindly but boldly saying, I will not, I will not comply with your government even if it kills me because I love my God that much. And in doing so, three other young men said, well, if he is not going to... By the way, there's seven, historically speaking, there's 70-some of these young men that have been taken from Judah. And so there's Daniel standing up by himself and saying that. Verse 8 of chapter 1 says, Daniel purposed. doesn't say anybody else did. It says, but Daniel purposed. But then it's implicit that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, Hananiah, Azariah, and... Um, uh, oh, what's the other one? But, but uh, Hananiah, Azariah, and... Mishael, thank you. How did I forget that one? Yeah, so those three guys, they, they step up. Those are their Hebrew names. They step up and they say, well, if he can do it, we can do it. And when you get to chapter 3, those three guys, Daniel's not around. They're standing by themselves. And they're saying, we're not bowing. And by the way, they're in their 30s at that point. According to the Septuagint, there's about 20 years difference between chapter 1 and chapter 3. So these guys are in their 30s. They've been doing this for a long time. And by the way, don't want to miss this. The end of chapter 1, you remember what the Bible says? The Bible says they were 10 times better. 10 times better. So here you have Daniel. The king changed his name to Belteshazzar, which means keeper of the treasure of Baal. But then you got Hananiah, Azariah, Mishael, and there they are. And... Man, they're standing, and they're saying, you know what? We're kind, and obviously they had a good standing with the government, but the government said, you've got to bow to this image, and they said, no, no, we don't. And you remember what the king said? The king called them in and said, you've got to bow, and they said, we don't. Well, who's this God that's going to deliver you? Well, he's the God of Israel. However, even if he don't deliver us, we're delivered. But if not, we're still not bowing because we answer to the higher power. And we've got to get this in our hearts and in our minds because, ladies and gentlemen, the day may come and it may be sooner than we think. Now, keep in mind, once again, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, Daniel, they were not belligerent about this. Uh, they were very kind. They were very gracious. Peter and John are the same. You don't see Peter and John flying off. Peter and John are very kind. And that's what we have to be. We have to be kind. Jesus was kind. Jesus was kind. These officials, though, they had no choice but to release them. Look at verse 21. Once again, verse 21. So when they had further threatened them, they let them go, finding no way of punishing them because of the people, <laughs> because of the people. They all glorified God for what had been done. For the man was over 40 years old on whom this miracle of healing 
had been performed. So they had no idea, you know, what are we supposed to do? We can't do anything. So that brings us to the report. So they're released, and look at verse 23. And being let go, Peter and John went to their own companions and reported all that the chief priests and the elders had said to them. So when the, the group, so when they heard that, listen, listen how they responded to Peter and John's response to the uh, Sanhedrin. When they, when they heard it, they raised their voice to God with one accord and said, Lord, you are God who made heaven and earth and the sea and all that is in them, who by the mouth of your servant David has said, this is Psalm 2, why did the nations rage? And the people plot vain things. The kings of the earth took their stand, and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. Do I have, do I have Psalm 2, Michelle? Do I have, let's read that. I, I want to read Psalm 2 literally here. Why do the, he, why do the nations rage? Uh, this is what they were quoting. And the people plot a vain thing. The kings of the earth set themselves, and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying... Let us break their bonds in pieces and cast away their cords from us. Uh, he, he who sits in the heavens shall laugh, and the Lord shall hold them in derision. Then he shall speak to them in his wrath and distress them in his displeasure. And the reason I, I brought that up is because uh, in, in Acts, they don't go as far. And by the way, you can read on in Psalm 2 and, and, and see the rest of it. But I just wanted you to see exactly what, what happens. This is what the Lord does. He'll speak to them in his wrath and distress them uh, in his deep displeasure. And so that's what they have done here is they've actually, they're, they're quoting this and they're rejoicing, you know, and uh, that should bring some comfort to us all. But I, I want you to do something. I'm going to take a quick journey. I know we typically, I typically have this stuff for you on the screen, but I'm just thinking about something that I want us to do uh, because I want us to go back and I want us to make sure that we understand what Jesus was saying about these events. If you will, go back, if you will, mark your place there and go back to uh, Mark 13, I believe. Go back to Mark 13, because I want to cross-reference what Peter and John did with what Jesus actually said. And I'm going to have you in one place in Mark and two places in Luke, but we're going to do it very quickly. But I just want you to see this. These are very familiar, very familiar verses. But it goes back to Peter and John revisiting what Jesus had said to them and being reminded, I believe, by the Holy Spirit. You remember what Jesus said in John 14? He said the Spirit, he's going to do what? He's going to teach you all things and bring all things to remembrance. All right, so watch, watch what happens here in verse, verse 11. Mark 13. But when they arrest you, Jesus says to his disciples, and deliver you up, do not worry beforehand or premeditate what you shall speak, but whatever is given you in that hour, speak that, for it is not you who speak, but the Holy Spirit. Now again, think about what happened here in Acts chapter 4. Think about what happened when Peter and John were standing there. As they speak, where's this, where is this speech coming from? What Jesus said, when they bring you up, the Spirit of God will give you. Now, the reason I'm having you to do this is because many times, you know, I've told you before that a preacher will stand up and he'll say, well, the Bible says that uh, when I stand up that he'll put the words in my mouth so I don't need to study. I disagree. I disagree. That is not what this passage is teaching. This passage is teaching that when you are brought before those that oppress you and those that accuse you, when you're brought before the council, God in that moment. Now, I even believe that we need to be prepared for that moment, right? Go over to Luke chapter 12. We'll look at Luke chapter 12 real quick. I'm bringing you back. But just go over one, just one book. All right, Luke is right after Mark, so it's not very far to go. And just go to Luke chapter 12. Luke chapter 12. And just make notes of these as you want to go back and probably study the entire context. But look at Luke chapter 12. Now look at verse 11. Jesus says this. It's a parallel passage. Now when they bring you to the synagogues and magistrates and authorities, do not worry about how or what you should answer or what you just should say. He says it again, parallel passage, as Luke records, for the Holy Spirit will teach you in that very hour what you ought to say. Now go quickly to Luke 21. I'm having you to do this because Jesus considered it to be so important. Look at verse 14. 
Therefore, Jesus says, settle it in your hearts, not to meditate beforehand on what you will answer. Again, same kind of context. For I will give you a mouth and wisdom which all your adversaries will not be able to contradict or resist. Now, isn't that exactly what has just happened in Acts 4? I'm going to give you the words to say, and they're not going to be able to resist it because you are speaking not from your mind and heart necessarily, but from what God's Spirit has put in your mind and your heart. Not what you can muster up, but what God's Spirit has put there. Now, back to Acts 4. Acts chapter 4, I just wanted to give you that because I think it's worth noting that when these guys are speaking, they are remembering what Jesus had said. Jesus said, this is what I'm going to give you. This is what's going to happen. So don't worry about it when you get there. And I say that to you as well. Say that to me as well. Now look at the request. Look at, verse, look at uh, 29 because the Bible tells us... Um, ooh, let's read... Uh, you know what? I'll stop short. Let's re read verse 27. Uh, for truly against your holy servant, Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate with the Gentiles and the people of Israel were gathered together to do whatever your hand and your purpose determined before to be done. And now look at the, look at the request that they make before God. Now, now, Lord, look on their threats and grant to your servants that with all boldness they may speak your word by stretching out your hand to heal and that signs and wonders may be done through the name of your holy servant, your holy son, Jesus. That's their prayer. As they're hearing what's happened, I believe they're reflecting back on what Jesus had said. And then they pray that prayer. Now, did you notice, never once did the church... Here's what they didn't pray. And this is kind of surprising, isn't it? Lord, please deliver us from this persecution. It's not there. Jesus had already told them, you're going to be persecuted. So they don't bother praying to be delivered from the persecution. Their prayer is actually to be delivered through the persecution. And not that they would survive the persecution, but they would thrive in the persecution. They simply ask, Lord, give us boldness in the midst of persecution to speak the word and give us power to be able to heal the sick in the midst of the persecution. In all of that, they realized that two things were, were relevant with Peter and John. Number one, a notable miracle had been performed. And in that era, that's how God was establishing his authorities. And number two, that they were speaking in boldness in the face of intense persecution. They understood, as we talked about last week, that persecution was and continues to be, as Dietrich Bonhoeffer put it, he said, persecution is the badge of Christianity. If you're going to be a Christian, you've got to wear the badge. Remember what Paul told Timothy, all who live godly shall suffer persecution. All who live godly shall suffer persecution. Our objective is to ask for boldness, not to ask for deliverance. Our objective is to pray for boldness in the midst of persecution, not deliverance from the persecution. And then I'll leave you with this in verse 31. Notice the resurgence. You've got to love it. And in, in, in the midst of all of this, as we've said before, and I believe this to be so true, I believe that the church not, don't just survive persecution. I believe they thrive in the midst of persecution. I believe the church grows in the midst of persecution. And this is proof positive, verse 31, the resurgence. And when they had prayed... The place where they were assembled together was shaken. Well, wouldn't you like to have that happen a little bit, you know? And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, remember, there's a difference between being filled with the Holy Spirit and being indwelt by the Holy Spirit. So as you read this, don't think, well, they're being indwelt. The Holy Spirit's coming in them. That's not what filled with the Holy Spirit means. You were indwelt by the Holy Spirit the moment that you're saved. But when you're filled with the Holy Spirit, that means you're completely controlled by the Holy Spirit. This crowd, everybody that's there, the Bible says they were filled with the Holy Spirit and they spoke the word of God with boldness. Well, that's an answer to prayer because what did they pray? They prayed that God would give them boldness. And what happened? If you ask God to give you boldness, God will fill you with his spirit and you'll speak with boldness. You say, well, Pastor John, I just don't speak with much boldness. Well, ask for it. First of all, confess your sin. Get before God and say, you know, Lord, I need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. You remember what filled means? It means to be controlled by the Holy Spirit. It means that you are being guided by Him and that He is directing you and that He is empowering you and He is enabling you. That's what it means to be filled with the Holy Spirit. 
So when Paul says in Ephesians 5, 18, be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess, he's talking about an agent that you allow within your body to control you. I was at an event the other night, and we were in our car, and I am not kidding. I've seen drunk people before, but I have never seen anybody this drunk. I mean, I just looked at my wife, and I said, have we ever seen anybody that drunk before? You know, other than the deacons' meetings, have we ever seen anybody? No, I'm kidding. That, Ronnie's off now, so we had not seen it in a while. No, have we ever seen, have we seen any, I'm, I, I ain't kidding, two people, two people literally dragging this girl across the parking lot. And I just thought to myself, why would you do that to yourself? Why would you do that to yourself? I mean, what possesses you to, to allow yourself to get in this condition because that alcohol had completely taken over her body and, and she was helpless. Anybody around could have done anything to her they wanted to do, anything to her at all. And she couldn't have done a thing. She couldn't even get to her car. Literally, she could not get to her car. And I... I just, you know, it's one of those things where it's like a train wreck. You, you want to look away, but you just can't because you have to see, are they going to get her in the car? And their car was parked about 20 feet from us. And I just watched and, and listened. They, they propped her up against the car and, and, and was opening the door. And she started to topple over. And they caught her at the very last second. I thought, you know, we're gonna, this girl's going to die right here. And it's so sad. But Paul uses that as the analogy. Don't be drunk with, don't allow something like that to control you. Allow the Holy Spirit that's inside of you to control you. Just as that alcohol had taken over that woman's body and had made her, you know, act in the way that she acted, the Holy Spirit can turn, uh, uh, turn it to a positive. He can take over your body. He can take over your mind. He can take over your heart. He can take over your speech. He can take over your actions. And He can empower you and enable you to speak with boldness in ways that you never could before. The alcohol makes you act that way. Because that's what it does. But the Holy Spirit can enable you to act this way because that's what he does. And I'll leave you with that. Let's pray. Lord, I pray that we would be filled with the Holy Spirit in a similar fashion as Peter and John in this context. God, I pray that we would take these principles and that we would understand, uh, God, that you and you alone can work the mighty miracles. You and you alone are worth standing up for. You and you alone. Lord, our, our audience. And Lord, as our government appears to get darker and darker, God, as the laws become more and more ungodly, even as we talked about in Sodom and Gomorrah where they protect the ungodly, Lord, I pray that we ourselves, we would obey our government right up until our government tells us to disobey you. God, may we forever be faithful and loyal to you. Lord, you know we can't do this ourselves God, it's not in us to want to speak with boldness. God, it's only in us if the Holy Spirit gives it to us. God, our default position is to be cowardly. Our default position is to run and to comply. And yet, Lord, you've placed us here to be lights, faithful beamers as we talked about Sunday morning. And God, I pray that that's be, that would be exactly what we are. Lord, help us to take this passage to heart. And God, I pray that as we walk out the door tonight, as we're sent, Lord, that you yourself would empower us through your spirit to speak with boldness, but God, to speak with courtesy. God, I thank you for the example of these midwives and thank you for the example of Daniel, and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. God, I, I thank you, Lord, for just how that they themselves, they were polite and they were courteous, but Lord, they were bold, bold as lions, even in the face of lions. And so God, thank you, Lord, for that. Thank you for that example. Lord, go with us tonight. Lord, we love you. We ask it in the name of Jesus. All God's people said, Amen. Amen. All right, next week, we'll be in Acts. <laughs> I know y'all want more.